It's a question of life and death for nearly half the uh, population on this planet. All the whole climate effort, only three percent of attention and budget is focused towards soil. If we do not address this now, we will regret it seriously in twenty-five years. How can you address climate change and global warming without addressing soil? All we are saying is, the soil that you farm must be alive. We are right now consuming the soil that belongs to the unborn child already. This is a crime. Namaskaram, Arundhati ji. Namaskaram, Sadhguru. Namaskaram. And uh, it's such an honor and a privilege to be on the same platform and talking to you. Sadhguru, at Salesforce, we believe business, all businesses are a platform of change. And our founder, Mark Benioff, says the business of business is improving the state of the world. And our one by one by one philosophy puts that into action. You believe in a similar ideology, I know. And at several forums, you have highlighted that no matter the kind of business one is into, ultimately, there is only one business, and that is human well-being. I'm honored to be in conversation with you, and we require you to inspire us and put us on the right track. There are a lot of leaders on this call, and we know that there is an issue that is gripping the world and with, on which we need to act soon, which is a solution to, uh, to the climate change. Uh, as you know, in 2019, during a UN General Assembly high-level meeting, the speakers warned that only 11 years were left to prevent irre irreversible damage from climate change. Two years have passed by, one of which ushered in a new threat to human survival, causing a global catastrophe. So now my question to you would be, for sustainability to have impact, scale and policy is critical. You have often underlined that. You are accordingly driving the Conscious Planet Save Soil movement, uniting with people across the globe for this common goal to restore the soil and rekindle humanity's relationship with Mother Earth. In addition, restoring, conserving and planting a trillion trees by 2030 can deliver massive and urgently needed progress against climate, biodiversity and sustainable development goals. Could you give us some more details of the movement and tell us how we can all join hands to drive scale and create impact? <clears throat> Namaskaram and... <laughs> Uh, well, as you, as you know, I don't have to highlight the problem. The problem is sufficiently been highlighted, especially for the audience that you have with you. I'm sure most of them know it, but just a few things to say. See, in this whole effort towards uh, addressing climate change and global warming, which are serious issues, it's a question of life and death for nearly half the uh, population on this planet. That's what it will be in another twenty-five years, I believe. So in this, the role of soil is very significant, but unfortunately, soil has not gotten the necessary uh, narrative attention as it should have. Right now, in all the whole climate effort, only three percent of attention and budget is focused towards soil. Rest is all focused towards carbon emissions and uh, you know, fossil fuels and stuff. I am not saying fossil fuels and carbon emissions are not an issue, they are serious issues. But you cannot do anything in this world without addressing the soil, because soil is the basis of all life. Whether you are a worm or an insect, or a bird or an animal or a plant or a tree or a human being, you are off the soil. There is nothing here which is not off soil. So not addressing the soil, is a serious distortion in the way we are trying to address the problem. In terms of carbon capture and putting it back into the soil, there is nothing more effective than photosynthesis. So, why is large tracts of land for months on end without any green cover on top of it? Whether there are no crop, uh, you know, cover crops, there is no grasslands, there is no uh, forest lands, everything is be taken away, seventy percent of world's land is under agriculture, but we are not addressing soil. Ninety percent of the deforestation is because of agriculture, not because of industry. Well, industry has its role in global warming by emissions and stuff, yes. See, that can be easily regulated. 
that is easy to turn... turn this around. But the soil degeneration that's happening, if you allow it to happen like this for another thirty to forty years, the loss of biodiversity would have reached a point where if you want to regenerate the soil, it will take one hundred and fifty to two hundred years. But right now, we are at a cusp of time that if we start the process now, in the next fifteen to twenty years, we can significantly turn the soil around, which is very important. Because carbon is there in the air, carbon dioxide is in the air, but when I s utter the word carbon, immediately people start thinking, this is some poisonous gases in the uh, atmosphere. We must understand, we as human beings, we are carbon life. The trees and plants that you see is carbon life. Every life that you see on this planet is carbon-based. So carbon is not poison, carbon is the basis of who we are. Our physical structure is carbon. So, where it should be, it is not there, it has gone somewhere else. It should be in the soil, but unfortunately it's in the air, that's all that's happened. So we need to capture it back means, the only way is photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the basis of beginning of complex life on this planet. This means using the perpetual energy of the sun, we are transforming the... what is in the air into carbon sugars and putting it back into the soil, and a whole exchange is happening between the microbial life and plant life, and then from plant life to animal life, from animal life and plant life to human life, all this happening fundamentally because of carbon in the soil, and that's where it should be. Right now, it is somewhere else where it should not be, or in the quantities where it should not be. And the oxygen levels in the uh, atmosphere are essentially determined by the photosynthesis. Why is so much land bare? It is either ploughed or paved right now. Urban lands are all paved, rural lands are all ploughed. This is a serious problem that must be addressed. If we do not address this now, we will regret it seriously in twenty-five years, because every responsible scientist is pointing out, by twenty-forty-five, there will be forty percent reduction in the food production that we are doing, and our populations will be 9.2 billion. This is not a world that you want to live in. This is not a world where you want to leave your children and go, where there is forty percent less food and twenty percent more population, because that is going to be a horrendous world. Already, UN agencies are predicting by 2035 to 2040, we can expect a lot of civil wars, dozens of civil wars across the world because of food shortages. Civilizational breakdown will happen. Humanity will lose all human sense once there is no food in a given society. So we need not drive ourselves in that direction once again. Just fifty, sixty years ago, we have gone through terrible famines and we've lost millions of people to it. Once again, we are driving towards this with all this advancement, with all these human capabilities that we have. Once again, walking into the same pit can be easily avoided with the necessary policy change and action. Well, the action is in everybody's hands, but policy change must happen to hold the commitment to action. Otherwise, I do something wonderful today, you do something wonderful in your place, but tomorrow somebody else comes and they will do something else. So if we have to hold it, it is important, it is enshrined in the policy. The way we must manage our soils, first of all, to understand that we are dealing with a living soil. Who we are right now is a consequence of the life in the soil. So not addressing soil as a material or a commodity, but as a living soil, as a living entity, how to keep it alive because soil is not our property. It is a legacy that we have received and we have to pass this on this way to future generations. This is a fundamental generational responsibility that we have. So right now the movement is to raise awareness or to get the support of 3.5 billion people. How do we arrive at this number? This is approximately sixty percent of the world's electorate. About 5.26 billion people have franchise on the planet. If three to 3.5 billion people support the movement, that means sixty percent. See, most governments, in the governments, people are aware of it, but they're not able to do anything because people have not expressed long-term commitment. People have not expressed their voice, has not spoken saying that if you show long-term commitment, we are willing to go through short-term sacrifices to make this happen. This people have to say, only then democratic governments will take those steps, because we must uh, understand the anomaly of what democracy is. On one level, it is the most reliable system that's worked for us till now. 
At the same time, the problem is, its term is only four to five years in most nations. So long-term commitments usually do not come beyond their legacy period they don't want to do because first of all, there's no mandate from the people. They are supposed to fulfill the people's mandate. This is a way of getting people's mandate for long-term commitments of governments. Everywhere I've gone in the last uh, few months, in the last two years, I've been talking about this to key people. In the last eight months, I've been openly speaking to thousands of people and I have not found one person saying, uh, I have not found one naysayer to do this. Everybody says this must happen. Most people, people who are actively engaged in climate activity, unfortunately were unaware of soil. I heard, uh, you know, environment ministers from various nations expressing to me one week that they were in COP26, uh, that is uh, in Glasgow, they did not hear the word soil. How can you address climate change and global warming without addressing soil? If people don't understand what I'm saying, you go out and stand in hot sun in India and then walk under a tree shade, you will understand what is climate change. This is what the soil needs. When you are in the sun, you seek shade. This is what every organism needs. All the microorganisms, first 12 to 15 inches of soil, is responsible for 87% li of life on this planet. That's what it is. We need to do this. Uh, Sadhguru, I can very well relate to this and I will tell you a very small incident. You know, I was in these rural branches where people used to um, uh, practice flood irrigation. So, you know, power is free. So in the night, they would switch on their pumps and go to sleep. And in the morning, they'd come and switch it off. But in the meanwhile, there would be a wastage of water the topsoil would get uh, washed away into the water bodies, thereby clogging up the water bodies. Plus, you know, the amount of fertilizers they were putting, they had to put more. Plus, the fertilizers were coming into the water bodies and creating all kinds of weeds and water hyacinths, which were further choking up the water bodies so that the level of water was going down, the water table was going down. And the soil itself, because it was getting washed away regularly, after, say, 12 years or so, it would become infertile and barren. There was so little understanding of what was happening. And again, as you say, you know, agriculture is not really regulated. Uh, you know, I used to find it very strange that these regulations are not enforced, that people are allowed to, you know, not only take away the nutrition from the soil, but, you know, actually make a big impact on the, eco on the economy itself by practicing these practices, which should definitely be barred. Instead of saying what should be barred, because right now the farmer's condition is so precarious, economically so precarious, uh, trying to be punitive with him is not going to work. What is needed is uh, a responsible agriculture. Responsible agriculture, as you said, you gave an example of irresponsible agriculture. A responsible agriculture needs a policy. Like for example, in a city, if you have 10,000 square feet of land, uh, you can't build 10,000 square feet home. You have to build six, seven thousand square feet, you must allow some space for yourself, your neighbor. But if you go, the, go into the old cities which are there, they are all, you know, house to house, they join, nobody can open a window because it's the next house. So from there we come to more planned way of constructing urban houses. But if you have, let's say, ten acres of land, you can plow every inch of those ten acres and turn it into a desert in twenty-five years, there is no law against it. We must have laws, but the laws must largely be uh, in terms of incentives, because to put cover crops, there is no incentive. There was a time, just forty, fifty years ago, cover crops in summer was a normal phenomena in this country. But today, there is no cover crop anywhere because farmer thinks, because somebody has told him, Somebody has educated him, you don't have to worry about all this, all you have to do is more fertilizer and throw it there, it's going to just bounce back. So his understanding is just that, if you throw some urea there, suddenly green leaf comes up and he thinks that is it, because uh, unfortunately that's where it is. So needed incentives have to come, UN has declared this year as the year of the millets. Millet is a very important movement. Millet consumption is a very important movement, both towards human nutrition, health, well-being, and also ecological concerns of the soil, how you use the soil, because it consumes 
much less and it also regenerates the soil in many ways. There are many things, I don't want to go into the policy, because right now we have written a policy book, a document which is over 800 pages of how to regenerate soil in hundreds of ways. Depending upon your latitudinal position, the type of soil you have, the regions in which you exist, and the economic conditions of a given society, and also the traditional uh, agricultural practices, taking all this into account, hundreds of ways in which you can regenerate soil. So we are not trying to tell you, you do this kind of farming. All we are saying is, the soil that you farm must be alive. It is not a commodity, it's a living entity. We must pass this on this way, because the strength of our life depends on the strength of the soil. And the strength of the soil determines the strength of every other life on this planet. Whether it's plant, animal, insect, worm or human, every life, the strength of that is determined by this. So this is a fundamental responsibility that we have as a generation. So this movement is to move 3.5 billion people where governments will feel comfortable to make soil policies which are long-term reach. Because right now, people are only asking for short-term trinkets. And accordingly, their governments are also functioning on those lines. But already as we have approached, many governments are signing MOUs with us towards this. And many other larger nations have started taking steps in this direction already. Within a matter of six to eight months, this much is happening. I'm very, very sure that in the next one year, most governments in the world will move in this direction. I am also addressing 170 nations in the COP15 in Ivory Coast in the month of May. So, UNCCD has come in as our partners, and also World Food Program has partnered with us. With this, we'll move ahead. What can the businesses do? Well, uh, many of the businesses like Salesforce and uh, in Mark's leadership, you have taken this in the direction of uh, the net zero, which is an important thing. But for soil, what is important is that right now this movement is starting from March 21st. For 100 days, I'm riding from London to Kaveri, a lone motorcycle, <laughs> and you know I'm 65. <laughs> so, in these 100 days, we want the whole world to talk about soil. This is not about me, this is not about a particular movement. We want the whole world to talk about soil for 100 days. NASCOM, there's no better place than NASCOM to address this because information technology has the reach that nobody ever had reach like this. This is the first time in the history of humanity that we can sit here and talk to the entire world. At a time like this, when we have technologies like this, if we do not, do not correct the mistakes that we have made, if we do not transform the way we conduct ourselves with relation to every other life around us, it simply shows that we don't care. A thousand years ago or even a hundred years ago, we did not have this reach. But for the first time we have this reach, this is the best time to make the transformation happen. I want every business involved with NASCOM, wherever you are, whatever the nature of your business, for one hundred days, let us enhance this voice that people care about the soil, so that governments listen. You must understand in a democracy, there's only one currency, numbers. So let's create those numbers and make them listen. And I've seen, I've spoken to many heads of state, they're all willing, but their only problem is people have never been supportive. So Sadhguru, you have actually answered part of the question I was going to ask you last, that is, you know, this being a technology... Oh, I'm sorry, if <laughs> no, I answered no, no, the other question. I'll, <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just repeat it in a little different way in the sense that this is a technology conference, right? What I'd like to ask you is, how can we use this technology to help elevate this movement for our future generations? And also because you are followed hugely by the younger generation, what is your advice for the younger generation? How can they participate? So this uh, unfortunate siloing up of, uh, uh, you know, wherever you are, people want to silo up. This is coming from a basic insecurity that by opening up, I will lose out what I have. This comes from a certain sense of... Uh, mm, <laughs> I'm sorry if I sound insulting. Uh, certain lack of profoundness in life, that you think that if this... if this you share with people, you will lose out on life. Sure. Uh, this is an unfortunate thing because the purpose of technology, especially information technology, is to break through all barriers, 
Well, information technology has brought this to us, uh, that today's technology has brought us this, that even national boundaries are no more absolute as they used to be hundred years ago or even fifty years ago. Now, national boundaries have become porous, you can talk what you want, you can put your soldiers on the border, but uh, American men and women are falling in love with somebody in Mexico, Indian people are falling in love with Pakistanis, Pakistanis falling in love with somebody else. I'm saying on all levels interactions are happening. You cannot stop it because technology has made our sense of limited identity kind of loose. It has to further loosen up because that is what spiritual process means, that you exist here without a sense of concretized identity. Your identity is only for functionality. Your identity is not an absolute. It never... it never is an absolute. Whether it is of race, religion, nationality, gender, whatever it is, it is only for functional purpose you need an identity. But there is no absolute identity because our... Uh, <laughs> our existence here is a brief fleeting moments that we are here for a few years and we are gone. And if we don't understand this, uh, I think people who don't understand this must consult the dead people. <laughs> what identities they hold, <laughs> they've all become part of this soil <laughs> So, especially those in the technology field should look beyond identifications like this and siloing up of technology, which impedes human possibilities, which impedes integration of human beings as one race, which impedes and also creates conflict on various levels, uh, impedes uh, coming together and creates conflict on various levels. So definitely those in technology world must uh, not silo up, must open up, because the more you open up, the more the possibilities. By siloing up, you only suffocate. Those who silo up are not going to be long-lasting. They may make some money initially, but that is not the purpose, because your money is only determining your lifestyle, it doesn't dis determine the nature of your life. The nature of your life depends upon how open and exuberant it is. That is what determines the nature of your life. Without openness, if you don't understand, put yourself in a glass case, in two minutes you will suffocate and die, all right? So, without opening up to the entire atmosphere, you can't breathe. Without opening up to the entire world, you cannot eat and digest what is there. Without the help of the gut microbe, you cannot even digest the food that you eat. So, I'm saying you cannot be siloed up because there is a cycle of life, it's a part of it. So, technology must understand and be in sync with life. In fact, every activity that we perform must be in sync with the natural cycles of life. Otherwise, we will work against the life process in trying to achieve something or what we think is an achievement. Actually, in this life, there is no other achievement than taking this life to its peak, its peak performance, peak experience of life. So, you can call it technology, you can call it music, you can call it dance, you can call it spirituality, it doesn't matter what you call it. Essentially, it is about this life finding full exuberant and full expression with everything that it can do. So, for this siloing up is definitely a big barrier that should not happen in the technology world. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Sadhguru. That was with this rousing call of... Uh, for collaboration, for innovation, for raising awareness across the planet. I hope this message will be... in means really, you know, internalized by all of us here in the audience. And we hope to be able to help you in raising this consciousness across the planet and to be able to help you. We definitely need your help because without technology, this moment cannot work. This moment cannot work because touching 3.5 billion people was not even a practical idea fifty years ago. It's only now we can think of this and that is only because of technology. Those of you who are in the technology world, <laughs> if I can call it that, those of you in the technology spaces, you must enhance this. And you also mentioned about the youth. Uh, it is very important that the young people must participate because... Uh, it does not mean the older generation should not, because the older generation is the culprits and they must participate. Uh, it is very important for us to understand, we are right now consuming the soil that belongs to the unborn child already. This is a crime. This is a crime against humanity. We are not consuming what belongs to us. We are consuming what belongs to the future already. This is not the way to conduct a responsible life. And also, 
uh, I am not for because this movement is structured in such a way, it is not against anybody. It is not against the fertilizer company, it is not against the pesticide company, it is not against this or that government, no. Because all of us are culprits. Now all of us have to come together for a solution. This is not to start a new fight. Already we have enough trouble, we don't need a fight. So children, if we engage them, must come in. This, this movement is a love affair with the land and life around us. This is not a fight with somebody. Always anything environmental means people hesitate because it's always a fight with somebody, it's always against somebody. Somebody just now in an interview called me, you're a uh, environmental warrior. I said, no, 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 no war, <laughs> no war, no warrior. <laughs> this is a love affair. <laughs> so, as a part of this, uh, we are asking... In India, I am asking ten million children to write a letter, a love letter to the Prime Minister, please save our soil. In the campaign, it's called Save Soil for the Adults, only for children, where they are using the word save our soil, because it's their soil that we are destroying and using up right now. So in similar proportions in all countries, we are asking children to write to their Prime Ministers or President and saying, save our soil, because we want the political leaders to feel comfortable that if they take steps in this direction, which will naturally have certain amount of resource involvement, certain amount of commitments, to do this, they must know that this generation, the next generation is with them. It's very important that they have this confidence when they take these steps, because democracies are mandates of the people. If people don't say it, it's not going to happen. So, let us say it loud and clear, because our oath, and our voice is the most important thing in a democracy. Let's raise our voice from 21st of March for 100 days. We want the whole world to speak about soil. And the technology people that you have with you are most important in this thing. It's only because of technology that something like this is possible. So let's make it happen. Thank you. We, we definitely and truly will try and participate. And thank you very much for coming here and addressing us and giving us your very valuable wisdom and your knowledge. Thank you. Namaskaram.